Has anybody ever heard of Billy Graham? Okay. Oh, well, good. Um, so I was reading this week, and I took a look. I, I have a book uh, of quotes uh, by uh, Billy Graham. And, um, and so I want to share, um, I don't know, one, two, three, four, about five, five short quotes that really is going to lead us into our message uh, this morning. The first two are on human nature. And Billy Graham said that the greatest need in the world is the transformation of human nature. We need a new heart that will not let uh, lust and greed and hate in it. Will Will not have that, I'm sorry. And we need a heart filled with love and peace and joy. And that is why Jesus came into the world. Secondly, Men cannot help that it is their nature to respond to the lewd, the salacious, and the vile. They will have difficulty doing otherwise until they are born again. And the rains are coming. Billy Graham said this on sin. He said, we have largely lost sight of the holiness and purity of God today. This is one reason why we tolerate sin so easily. And then on faith, he said this. Faith in Christ is voluntary. A person cannot be coerced, bribed, or tricked into trusting Jesus, God will not force his way into your life, and the Holy Spirit will do everything possible uh, to disturb you, draw you, love you. But finally, it is your personal decision, just like Bud this morning. And here's our hope. Our last quote from, from Dr. Billy Graham. Man has no ability to repair this damaged planet. The flaw in human nature is too great. God is our only hope. That's it. You see, we all go through life and we grumble about everything. One thing or another, we grumble. Wah, 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 I can't stand that. Wah, 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 wah. So my question to you is when you hear God's voice, what will you do? What will you do? I want to invite you to open your Bibles this morning. We're uh, in chapter 3 of the letter to the Hebrews. And we're going to look at verses 7 through 19, which is the end of the chapter. Uh, If you would be so inclined and you feel like it, uh, you can stand. And let's read God's word together, beginning in verse 7. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw me uh, and saw my works uh, for uh, for uh, and saw my works for 40 years therefore i was angry with this generation and said they always go astray in their heart and they did not know my ways. I read that and I just it gets me every time. As I, as I swore in my uh, wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that fail, falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. 
For we have become partakers of Christ. If we uh, hold fast uh, the, begin, uh, the beginning of our assurance from until uh, firm until the end. While it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts all uh, as when they provoked me. Verse 16. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest but to those who were dis- disobedient. Last verse, Gesei Gesund. So we, so we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. You may be seated. That's God's word this morning. I struggled through that, but that is God's word this morning. Um, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to see the importance of responding to God's voice and call and, and, and the call on your life. Our series is Keep the Faith. You know, I throw that out in front of everybody. I want you to always remember, what, what are we doing in the series? Well, the, the goal is for us to keep the faith. And it's going to mean something different uh, depending upon what our writer is talking about and to whom he is speaking. But we want to keep the the faith. Well, the fact is this series is starting to kick into gear, into high gear, if you you were to ask me. And our message this morning is very simple. You ready? Consequences for our actions. Have we ever heard that before? Has anybody ever said to you, you know, there are consequences for your actions? When I was a kid growing up, my dad used to say, hey, you do A, B is going to be a consequence of that action. So you've got a choice. What are you going to do? So where are we in the scheme of life as it relates to the first um, two and part of chapter three in this letter to the Hebrews? Well, in our previous paragraph, which is the beginning of chapter three, we found out as the writer wrote that Jesus is above Moses, that that Moses was um, appointed, uh, was a servant, but Jesus was sent by God over all things, That, that Jesus is truly the architect of our lives. He's the builder. He built this house that we are in today. I'm not talking about the physical structure. I'm talking about us as a family of believers. And so, as, as a result, uh, we need to listen to what Jesus has to say. Uh, there's a great need for us uh, to stay faithful. Um, we're in a world today, uh, and, and this is really to the point of what this writer is saying that even in the first century, but as you see, he goes back into the Old Testament from when uh, God uh, pulled the Israelites out of Egypt and promised them the promised land to bring them in. But what did they do? They grumbled. Their faith waned. They, They didn't hang tight with one another. Well, he's speaking to the Jewish Christians in this letter who apparently are starting to kind of go off the road a little bit. Well, that's all great for people 4,000 years ago, and that, that's great for those 2,000 years ago, but here's the problem. We're in the exact same place today that we were over 4,000 years ago. And we are going to get to the point where we are going to pray for God to pull us out of bondage and to lead us into the promised land. And God is going to say, no problem, believe. If you would believe, I 
will fulfill the promise in your life. But you've got to believe. This unbelief is a reality today as much, if not more, than it was. Here's the beauty behind Bud, right? It, listen, it couldn't have happened at a more perfect time this morning uh, when I see this family standing outside of my office, and I'm thinking, oh, what did I do? What did I say? Well, you know, did I do something wrong? And I, I, well, can we go into the office? I'm, and my heart starts to go like this. I'm like, is everything okay? Well, we got some news for you. What's that? Bud would like to ask you about what it is to believe in Jesus Christ. Well, the scriptures are clear as we walk into this, into this latter part of this chapter that if we believe, anything is possible. When we are in a mode of unbelief, nothing is possible. And, and we're in a scary place right now. In my first point this morning... Well, let me just say this, uh, uh, rejecting Christ, um, it, it's, not, it's not like when you were a kid and you did something wrong and your dad punished you for a minute or, or got the switch out and, you know, because I know some of you in this room, and I'm not pointing fingers, probably got it pretty good, ching okay? No, this is an eternal an eternal repercussion that will take place when you reject Christ. There's no, you reject him, there's no coming back from it unless you welcome him. So in my first point this morning, it's titled, I'm Running in Circles. And quite frankly, in our world today, we see it. We see people running in circles. It's not, uh, it's not out of the question. We don't know which way is up, which way is down, because we're running in circles. If any of you have ever taken a baseball bat and put your head on the bat and turned around like this and then tried to run in a straight line, you can't do it. You know, maybe Zach, but I don't, you know, other than that, I, I you know. Where did this all come from? In the second part of verse 7. So just looking at verse 7, it says, Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, and again, therefore, your connector word that ties the first part of that paragraph to what's taking place, it steps immediately into a quote from Psalm 95. So when we read, today, if you hear his voice, woo, if you turn with me to, to Psalm 95, verse 7b, okay, so that's the second half of part of verse 7 says, Today, if you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And it goes on, and basically the writer of Hebrews is quoting, is quoting the psalmist. The first part of that psalm is about praise and everything. It's wonderful. But then in the latter part of that, of that psalm, he's pretty much hitting us up against the head and saying, that we must believe, right? History uh, repeats itself. We've heard that term over and over again for those of us that have been around for any length of time. History repeats itself. No, not this time, Pastor. We're moving forward. Well, here we go. There's no, the, the only reason that the uh, writer to the Hebrews is saying what he is saying is why? Because whatever is going on during the first century is repeating exactly what took place when? When they were in the wilderness. And where does that all come from, right? So the, the story in and of itself, and, and we don't have time to go back and read all of this, but um, if you went to Exodus uh, chapter 7, verses 1 through 7, it's, a, it's about going out, right? That's, that's the first part of it. And then what we see, the judgment 
of what is going to happen is repeated in Numbers uh, verses, uh, chapter 14, verses 20 through 38. I don't know. Do you have that up there? I can't see that far. Um, those verses for everybody to uh, take a look at, okay? And, um, and, and just jot that down. Go back and read it so that you can put it back into, into its uh, context. Um, the writer knew exactly what he was doing. And you know why? Because this is us today. This is us today. We're literally in a wilderness. We, we have allowed sin to become the norm, and, and the worship of God, the living God, the only true God, that has become the exception. I, I might have mentioned this. I know I mentioned it on Wednesday night, but here's the reality. There are 4.6 billion people in the world today that have never heard the gospel. That's a daunting number. What are we doing? Are we listening to the voice of God and responding, or are we rejecting what he calls us to do? Because he's promised us heaven. Our problem is we want heaven right now. So we reject him to get whatever it is we think we need, whatever it is we think we want, whatever it is that we think is going to make us happy in the moment, that's what we go for. And we don't have any forward thinking in our heads to see the promise that God has given to us is an eternal promise. It's not a moment promise. Do not do what the generation of the Jews did who died in the wilderness under the judgment of God. It's not popular today to say, I walk for Jesus, not for anybody else. I have been exiled from Facebook I'm allowed, and it's, I'm not allowed to post any pictures. I can't post a, a share, a video. Can't even share a video. This has been going on for over a week. And I, this is how ridiculous it is, okay? Any of you who are on social media, you see the nonsense that's coming across your, your feeds and everything like that. My content, for whatever it was that they that they struck me down for, uh, did not meet community standards. And the only thing I post on is Jesus. It's all I post on. But on Tuesday at 1.08 in the afternoon, I'll be allowed to share a picture again. That's how ridiculous they got. Literally, 1.08 in the afternoon on Tuesday. So I have two more days uh, that I have to be punished. I'm in timeout. For those of you that have kids, see, Ruby's sitting here. Ruby never goes to timeout because Ruby's perfect, okay? If you want a lesson in perfection, all you have to do is talk to Ruby. She will share with you what perfection looks like. The best little girl in in the world. And so um, she puts up with me, so you know she's really good. Um, Anyway... But we we have to start thinking in terms of do we want to sit in the wilderness or do we want to move forward? What do we want to do? Do we want to answer the call that God has in our life or would we rather wallow in the misery of sin? Because that's where you can be. And so the hardening of the heart is the ultimate downfall. This is the thing that gets us, right? Uh, I talk to a lot of friends uh, who are not believers, and um, their hearts are so hard against Christianity. Why? I'm not forcing you to believe. Why are you so angry because I do? I, I share with you the love of Christ. You can do with it whatever you want to do, just as Billy Graham said in, in that quote. You know, I, I'm not, I can't make you believe I could tell you about them. It's your choice. The Holy Spirit might convict you, might stir your heart a little bit. He might pull and tug on you, but ultimately, 
It's your choice. But when you have hardened your heart, God moves on. And how do we know that to be true? Because he killed an entire generation of people for non-belief. And maybe that's what we're going to experience here. That, that he is, you know, he, he promised that there wouldn't be any floods, but he might do it in a different way. I know that's, that, that's not what you want to hear this morning, and I know you want some rah-rah, the Super Bowl is today, get me excited, Pastor. I'm going to get you excited. I'm going to get you excited about who? About Jesus. I'm going to get you excited to let you know that football is, is not your idol, Okay? Love the game. I love the game. I'm excited about uh, uh, Brock Purdy, and I'm excited about Patrick Mahomes. Why? Because they're not afraid to profess their faith in public. That's great. But here's the reality of the deal. It's a game. And, and two years from now, you're not going to remember who did what in that game. However, if you breathe your last breath, trust me, you're going to remember for all eternity the decisions you made or did not make. And that's where we really need to go. We heard testimony yesterday that, quite frankly, you know, could have gone either way. But Jesus didn't let go. Jesus won't let go if he knows. And you say, I just, I, I'm, he'll hang on until you're ready. But if you say, take care, brush your hair, he's gone. That's what my buddy Patrick used to tell me all the time. Listen, you're getting to a point where I've given you every opportunity. God is going to say, well, maybe he doesn't want to. I'm going to go to somebody else. That scared me. <laughs> I'll just be honest with you. It scared me because I'm like, well, I, I better make a decision. Make a decision. Stop waffling. Uh, the hardening of the heart is the ultimate downfall. Hardening the heart is a result of rejecting God's call or his instruction. See, the Jews were what? Going out of Egypt, that was, that was God's people. They're still God's people. They are the chosen nation. And yet within that chosen nation, they said, I, you know what? I'm grumbling. You promised me, you know, the land of milk and honey. Where is it? And God says, stop grumbling. I got you water. Stop grumbling. I gave you manna. Stop grumbling. We're going to get there. But you know what happened? The only one who got to go in of, of the original generation that was set free were Joshua and Caleb. He killed everybody else. He rocked their world, for lack of a better term. Listen, hardening is an action. It's an action. It's a, it's a conscious decision that we, that we make in terms of doing something. And, and you want to stop, right? Who are the culprits? We're the culprits. We're the ones who harden our hearts. God doesn't harden your heart. He knows what decision you're going to make. That's for sure. Why? Because... He's omniscient. He knows. He, he knows uh, past, present, and future all at the same time. He sees it. You know his head is spinning with all the nonsense that's going on right now. Right? Wake up. Wake up. God didn't do whatever it is you think he did to you. You made the decision to do whatever it is. The beauty is is that even if you're in the middle of that pit, God's still willing to reach his arm down. All you got to do is lift your arm up, and he'll pull you out of the pit. That's the God that I serve. That's the God that we as believers serve. And so when we do something for a period of time, what happens? You've heard this saying over and over again. Uh, if you do something for 21 days, it is no longer an exception, it becomes a habit. Um, for those of us that uh, used to smoke, I'll use smoking as an example, okay? If you stop for 21 days, not with any helpmates and all that other stuff, you've now begun a habit. And it is easier to get to, onto the other side of that mountain because you've been doing it for 21 days. 
right? So I haven't smoked in 22, over 22 years was the last time I had a cigarette. It's been over 28 years since I've had a drink of alcohol. I couldn't do that in my own strength. I had to call on God to remove the desire from me. And once that occurred, it was, it was free sailing. I, I don't even think about having a drink anymore. I don't think about having a cigarette. And some of you know what that's like. You know what that feeling is. You know what it's like, especially with cigarettes, because it's a physical thing. Alcohol is a physical thing. Once you become dependent upon something, it's very difficult to let go of it. When we do something for a period of time, it becomes a habit. Habitual disobedience becomes a habit. If we continue to be disobedient to God, we don't even know what it is to be obedient to God because the habit formed is what we take forward. And so this habitual disobedience to God results in what? It results in, in, for lack of a better term, it's like being in court and the judge gives you a a, a, a judicial decision. You've been uh, habitually uh, against me for this period of time. I've given you every opportunity. You are a repeat offender. And as a result, there are consequences. What is the consequence? Well, in a, in a, a, a trial, uh, if you've committed a crime, the consequence, although today you might disagree with me, um, you're supposed to go to prison. You know, in, in New York, that's irrelevant. You could do whatever you want in New York and let, get let out without bail. But that's another story. Stay with me. All right. I'm not going down that road, right? See, I'm going to stay on the road of obedience to the Lord not angry over the world. But all of this in, in and of itself, habitual disobedience to God results in this idea of a sentence. And then the generation, and here's the reality, the generation of Jews that came out of bondage, they had to deal with a judicial sentence. And that judicial, judicial sentence was very clear. Sorry, but you're not going in. Even Moses, think about it. Moses did everything. At the age of 80, God calls Moses and says, lead my people out of, out of bondage. And he looks at God and says, you got to be kidding me. I'm 80 years old. I don't know anything about this, this stuff. But he was obedient until he wasn't. Because he let, he, he let them get in his head. And as a result, Moses gives a wonderful speech in Deuteronomy. Hello. Um, but gives a, a, a wonderful response in Deuteronomy. And it's a farewell response because he knows that God is not going to bring him into the land of milk and honey. Well, it's the same thing with the people. He lets them do what it is that they're doing. They continue in their level of disobedience, but there's a, there's a result to the action, a consequence to the action. Our lives are exactly the same today when we look at what God is calling us to do. Okay, so I've kind of drugged that home pretty good. Um, he, here's the thing that I want to uh, point out to you and maybe ask you this question. Does God get angry? Huh? You think? In verse 10 uh, of, this, of this chapter, uh, what we see is, therefore, verse 10, I was angry. Some of us have, uh, and I'll, I'll steal a, a line from a movie, some of us have spent thousands of dollars with a therapist to be able to say, I'm angry. I'm angry. God says, I'm angry. Does God get angry? Yes. And it is a justified anger. It's very different than the anger that we profess when we get angry. 
our anger is much more of a misplaced anger. What's a good example of that? If you're at the office, you get angry at a fellow employee because they didn't do something you wanted them to do. You're, you're in, a, in a store and you're buying food and, and the kid who's behind the counter is not giving you your change fast enough. You get angry. You see, humans get angry. Dogs get mad. Pray for the Williams lab. I'm just saying. He defended the house a few days ago, but he, 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 got, he got a couple of licks from it. And so, um, pray. And um, so, I, I, I kind of went off track there. But yes, uh, it is a justified anger. All of that is a reality. Th- there are consequences um, to habitual disobedience. And that's really the point that I, I went around the world to get to. Um, but obedience to God is the most important thing that we could do as believers. God will use you when you're obedient. You ask sometimes, I don't understand why nothing's going on in my life as it relates to, well, maybe you need to do a little bit of soul searching. What is your day-to-day life really look like? Where are you at? I had a gentleman yesterday morning say, you know, my, because we were talking about how important it is for men to lead their homes. It's very important, especially from a spiritual perspective. And, and uh, statistically, uh, if men, I think I've shared this before, but statistically, if men bring their families to church, probably 80% of that family gets saved. If a woman is bringing uh, their family to church, it's like 13%, something ridiculous. It's, a, it's, a, it's so lopsided, it's unbelievable. And one of the guys in the, in the breakfast yesterday morning said, you know, my wife will remind me if we haven't been praying together. When are we going to pray together again? And it is a reminder that I'm supposed to be the spiritual leader in that household, and I stop what I'm doing, I apologize, and I become obedient again. God welcomes that. He is a forgiving God. It doesn't matter how bad you messed up. Confess and be, and, and be made righteous again. God promises that in his word. Here's my second point. I'm falling. I'm falling, right? Verses 12 through uh, 14, it says the peril of unbelief. We start to spiral out of control, right? Uh, Is the writer talking to believers? That was the big question in all my reading that I did over this past week or so. You know, some believe that he was talking to unbelievers. I don't necessarily ascribe to that uh, because of the way that he says certain things. He says, take care, brethren. What does that mean? We know that word brethren means brothers, sisters. That means we're family. And if he's addressing them as brethren, he's got to be addressing believers. And so we can go on that note um, that if they were uh, then, uh, if they were then, the writer warns uh, them about losing. Um, let me read that again. Ooh, I wrote a note and I don't know what in the world I was trying to say. Uh, if they were then, if they were then, the writer warns, if they were believers, that's my point. If they were believers, the writer warns them about losing rewards not salvation. So this whole idea, it has nothing to do with, a, with losing your salvation, and that was really my point in looking and, and unpacking this text, that we are storing up rewards. We talk about that all the time, storing up rewards in heaven. But all of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and all this stuff you think, but if you're not disobedient, you're, you're still going to heaven, Okay? But our desire should be as believers to do what? To, to be obedient to the Word of God, to be obedient to the call that God has in our lives. It's awesome. I, you know, all of us know what we were like before we knew God. All of us know what we're like now that we are 
in family with God. It makes all the difference in the world. In the world, uh, non-believers, uh, then they will be separated for eternity, and that's a hard truth that a lot of non-believers don't want to hear. They don't want to hear if you don't believe, you're going to hell. Well, who are you to tell me where I'm going? There's all these other things, all these other religions that tell me how I can get to heaven. But the scriptures tell us there's only one way. That's what the scriptures tell us. I received a gift in the mail came here to the church, ministerial leadership. It was in a box. I opened it up. It's a beautiful book. It's, it's you know, plastic wrapped in. I, I open it up. I start thumbing through, and I'm like, sounds kind of weird. And I, so I look up the author, and I wasn't familiar with the author. Um, E.G. White, I think, was the name of the author. I find out she's the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. <laughs> I'm like, now I understand why some of what I was thumbing through was so weird, right? People think that there's all these different ways to get to God. Jehovah's Witness believe in the Watchtower. Mormons believe in the Book of Mormon. Everybody wants to figure out a different way to get it done when the Bible is so clear. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one shall come to the Father except by me. Uh, what, what verse is that? John 14, 6. Why do we have to know John 14, 6? Class on Wednesday nights, is that not one of the scriptures we are to memorize? For what purpose? For evangelism. People need to know that there is only one way. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, what did he do? He gave his only begotten son. Not that you could believe in Mormonism, but that if you believe in the Son who He sent, you will be saved. That's what we're talking about. I'm falling. These people didn't know what to believe. We live in a world today, they don't know what to believe because there's so much nonsense out there. They're running from one thing to the next. As such, they, like us, must demonstrate the reality of their faith by doing what? Enduring in their commitment and refuse what? To be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Satan is a liar. As a matter of fact, he's the king of lies. And every time you buy into it, you get further and further and further away from the Word of God, the truth, the living God who breathed this Word into existence. Obedience is a big deal once we are believers. Nobody cares what you do if you're not a believer. But once I'm a believer, first of all, it frustrates the absolute nonsense out of Satan. He's coming after you. He could care less about a non-believer. Why? Because they're already going where he wants them to go. But for us, he's going to hammer us until we get off the path that God has called us to be on. Okay. In verse 14, we must be partakers with Christ. Talking is not enough. I, you know, I can't help it. I've got to go back to Wednesday night. What, why, talking about evangelism is not as good as actually participating in evangelism. We got to do it. It doesn't matter whether it's in the way that you live, whether it's preaching, whether it's just sharing a testimony, whether it's saying, hey, what's your spirit, spiritual belief? Where do you go to church? Asking a very simple question, where do you go to church? I don't go to church. What do you do? I don't do anything. Have you ever thought about it? I don't know. You know, you're just talking to somebody. You're not, you're not r running around thinking to yourself, well, I've got to be a theologian. No, you don't have to be a theologian. You have to be what Christ has called you to be, and that's a witness for the gospel. That's what we're called to be. I know a church up in, in, in the north part of this state, they are filled with people who have doctorates, brilliant minds. And you know what? That church is imploding 
Why? Because they don't do anything. They don't, all that academic knowledge that they have, all that book smart that they have, they're keeping it all for themselves. They're not taking it out the way that God has called them to take it out. And so the church is imploding from the inside out. God gives you a gift, pay it forward. That's what it is. Pay it forward. He wants you to share the gospel. Tell people about the good news. The reader started off with great confidence and hope, and they, they must hold this hope until the end, right? We as believers, we got to hold on to it. So a couple of things are going to happen. As we hold on to this, well, one or two things, really, three things maybe. We're either going to die and we get to go to heaven. Christ is going to come back and take us home. Um, and that's a, a, a great, de- a great, I, and that, that's going to be awesome. <laughs> when, when Christ and he just takes his, he takes his family home. I feel sorry for those that are going to be left behind. That's why it's so important. 4.6 billion people that have never heard the gospel. Doing so in terms of maintaining your hope, if you do this, we enjoy the benefits of what? of a family relationship. See, we we sometimes forget that, um, and we we think in terms of, well, I go to church on Sunday, but you know, when you look around at the people that are in this room, this is your family. We, We gather to corporately worship on Sundays, but we take care of each other every single day of the week. Right? We, we, you know, I'm thankful for Grace right now because she has uh, really taken the ministry of caring for Sarah and Isabel to the next level. She talks to them. She brings them things, you know, to make sure they're okay. We need to pray for Miss Isabel. She's in long-term uh, rehab at, at, at Regent Nursing Home, right? We have to pray for Miss Sarah. She just came home, but she's weak. She had a heart attack. She's got major blockage. We need to be praying for our brothers and our sisters, We need to be taking care of our brothers and our sisters. This is what God has called us to do. So when I say to you, I'm falling, I'm falling because I'm not doing uh, what God has called me to do. I'm falling because I'm not being obedient. I'm falling because I've allowed sin to enter into my life, and as a result of it, I take hold of that deceitfulness, and I start to forget about the Word of God. That's who we are. But together, we can conquer Satan. That's why we gather to worship together in the house that Christ has built. He's the head. We're the body. He's our groom. We're the bride. This is who we are in Christ. We experience his presence on earth. People who are not believers don't understand that. We participate in his heavenly kingdom. We've been promised something that others just will never understand unless they believe. Here's my last point this morning. I'm not believing. That's it. You can talk till you're blue in the face. I'm not believing. In the last part of this chapter, verses, uh, uh, what, uh, 15 through 19. It's, again, the writer repeats himself from Psalm 95. He says what? Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. Listen, the message is very clear right now. The message says that if you do not know Jesus, you need to believe today. Message says that. Because if not, God is going to harden your heart. Your heart is, well, I shouldn't say, your heart will be hardened. Why? Because you refuse to believe. I can't force you to believe. I'm just telling you what's going to happen if you don't. Okay? You can do with that information whatever you choose to do with it. That's on you. 
okay? And you can believe me and say, hey, you're ranting and raving, you're, you're silly, you know, it's good for you, knock yourself out. Here's a life lesson. When you hear God's word, heed God's word. Heed it. Get ready for it. Accept it. Believe it. Move with it. Learn it. Know it. And do what? Become a part of the family because of the word that God has given to you. Believe and obey. Believe and obey. All those who came out of Egypt, what did they do? They rebelled, except for Joshua and Caleb. And God's anger was against those who sinned. They died in the wilderness. I don't want to die in the wilderness. Whether you want to believe it or not, right now we're living in the wilderness because things are so kooky. It's where we are. I don't want to die in the wilderness. I'm ready to rock and roll, folks. I'm ready to, you know, to, to go to the umpteenth level to let people know about Jesus, the love of Jesus, the hope in Jesus, the gift and forgiveness in Jesus, the faith that we have in Jesus, the importance of what it is to believe in Jesus. Why? Because it's an eternal decision that you will make. God's anger was against those who sinned. Our unbelief will cause our eternal separation from God. If you don't know Jesus Christ, I'm just telling you, here it is. If you're with Christ, you got a future. If you are without Christ, your future is very, very different. And his name is Satan. And it is horrific difference in choice. So here's a reality check as we close, and and Cliff will join us, and we'll have a a time, um, and I'm going to ask, we're going to go through some stuff, but here's the reality check. What took place then is very real today. The deceitfulness of sin exists, and it's working. It's working. Just look around you. It's working. The hardening of the heart and the departing from God, it's real in our world today as it was 2,000 plus years ago when the writer of Hebrews wrote. What should we do? That's what you've got to ask yourself. Well, I'm going to tell you a little bit of what I think we should do. We need to encourage one another to remain strong in the faith. When your brother falls, pick him up. Ecclesiastes is very clear about that. Encourage one another to remain strong in the faith and in obedience to God. If you continue to reject God like those in the wilderness, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a fact. And it's a hard fact. It's not, it's not something that we, we want to admit to, but that's the reality. If you continue to harden your heart towards Christ, you will die in the wilderness. And so my question to you is I ask every week, if you've never asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I want you to know that Now is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. And and like I said, Cliff Cliff is going to lead us in worship as we uh, pray uh, together. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're going to do that too. And um, I want you to know, let me just pray uh, for those that are watching and those that are going to receive Christ right now. Father, right now, Lord, I just pray, God, as every head is bowed and every eye closed, Lord, that if there is one amongst us that does not know you, that today truly will be their day of salvation. What a glorious time in our lives to know that even with the fray going on around us, you are faithful to us. And now my prayer is that we too would be faithful uh, to you. God, first and foremost, 
is to call upon the name of Jesus to be our Lord and Savior. Second is to be obedient in the call that you place on each and every one of our lives. And, and thirdly, not in any one particular order, but th that we are obedient to do what? To bring the good, news, the good news to everybody else who does not know it. God, I thank you for that opportunity, and I thank you for those that have prayed this morning to receive you as their Lord and Savior, that they have turned from their evil ways, that they have admitted that uh, you lived, died, and rose on the third day, that they are confessing with their mouth and believing in their heart that you rose on the third day. God, thank you um, for your word. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for his life, his death, and his glorious resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.